Well, I had everything all planned out. I had worked hard all week. Actually, the first of the week I worked extra hard because I knew the end of the week was going to be extremely busy. And um, as I was parking my truck in the parking lot, God speaking to my heart, that's really not what I want you to preach this morning. I thought, hmm. I uh, went out to the um, Strawberry Festival this morning. We had a uh, worship service out there, which was pretty cool. I was able to speak to some people that, that I'd never <coughs> spoken to before and uh, shared something with them. And God laid on my heart, said, why don't you just share the same thing with the congregation this morning? I thought, but Lord, I only spoke five minutes out there. If I speak five minutes to this group, they'll get used to it. (laughs) Because most of you know I don't speak five minutes. Let me ask you a question. Um, I think it's a pretty important question. Have you ever given much thought to why God created you? Seriously, have you ever thought much about why you're here? What is your purpose? Do you believe God does everything for a reason? Do you believe that? So we must come to the conclusion that if you are here, there is a reason. Is that a pretty good conclusion to come to? I I believe that it is. Nobody's a mistake. That's right. Nobody's a mistake. I love the verse of Scripture over in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, two and verse 10. I like verse, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 8 and 9 is fantastic, and all of us Baptists know what 8 and 9 says. Amen? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I love that verse of Scripture because it's, it's, it's truth. But uh, verse 10 is so important as well. Verse 10 says, We are God's masterpiece. Isn't that cool, Jamie? We are God's masterpiece. Now, uh, there's days that I question that for me. But that's what the Scripture says, and I have to believe what the Bible says. Nick, we're God's masterpiece. God don't make junk. Right? Right. Now, we can take a masterpiece, and we can mess it up. You can go, you can spend $50,000 on a violin. That's a masterpiece. And you can destroy it. You can drop it. You can pour stuff on it. You can pay no respect to it whatsoever. And after a few weeks or months or years, It hardly serves the purpose in which it was created. But that's not the fault of the Creator that created the violin, is it? So when the Bible says we are God's masterpiece, if we mess it up, it's not the fault of the Creator. We cannot hold Him blame for that. It says, we are God's masterpiece. I like the rest of this verse. It says, He has created us in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this. I love this. So we can do the good things He planned for us. Is that not cool? So what is our purpose? Our purpose is, the Scripture says here in Ephesians 2.10, that He created us in Christ Jesus so that we can do 
the things that He has planned for our life. Amen. So what is our purpose? What is Nick's purpose? What is Jamie's purpose? What is, what is all of our purposes? We are created so that we can do the things that God has planned for our individual, that's right Terry, for our individual life. For our life. I can't do what God planned for John. He can't do what God planned for my life. He can only do what God planned for his life. And God has a plan. Amen? Amen. John just recently got on the bus. God's doing the driving. I told him, I said, don't worry about where you're going. Just get on the bus. God will take care of the rest. Leave the driving to him. Amen. And he'll take care of the rest. Another verse of scripture that I like a lot is over in Psalms 139. Psalms 139 and uh, verses 14 through uh, verse, verse 18. And I believe I'm using the New Living Translation. It's these. I typed these out for the early morning service. It says this. Now, these, this passage of Scripture is, is one of my favorites. And those of you that know my life you probably understand the reason why it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, I, I grew up thinking that I was junk for a lot of different reasons. These verses of Scripture, God told me I wasn't junk. Spoke directly to me. The psalmist says in 130, Psalms 139, verse 14, Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex, it says. Thank you, the psalmist says, for making me so wonderfully. Now, I know for a fact that sometimes we don't feel so wonderfully made. I know that. I understand that. I, there's many days I, 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 I just don't feel so wonderfully created. But God says, I am. Now, you may not like the, the, the way that you look. You know, all of us can't be as pretty as Jeb or ugly as John. <laughs> you know, but, but let me tell you something. John and Jeb can say, Thank you for making me so wonderfully. Amen? Amen? We're just what God wanted us to be. Maybe your nose is a little crooked, or your eyes don't look so great, or maybe your hair, or maybe you don't have hair. I don't know what it is. But you are wonderfully created. And the psalmist says, thank you. Personally, I think we ought to stop all the plastic surgery and all this other junk and just be satisfied the way God made us. That's what I think, but what good is my opinion? Your workmanship is marvelous, he says. Verse 15 says, now, now look at verse 15. You watched me, the psalmist speaking to God, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion wow now again different verses speaks to different people in different ways you know when we have our Wednesday night service a lot in our life application Bible study uh, when I'm facilitating a Bible study uh, sometimes I'll read a verse of scripture and won't even make a comment on it I'll just simply say would somebody here tell me what that verse says to you as an individual and we may ask two or three people about that and get two or three different messages how that verse speaks to you. But when I look at Psalms 139 verse 15, I'm going to, I get a message that probably nobody else gets a message in this verse. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. 
most of you know that uh, I'm adopted and, and uh, I, I don't know who my biological father was. Um, I was born, the name that I had when I was born was Charlie Russell Tant. That was the name that was given to me because my biological mother said that my father's name was Raymond Tant. I even got a newspaper article when I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. It says, born to, bo a son born to Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, Russell Tant. And, and um, recently, I became acquainted with Russell Tant's brother, whose name is Clayton, a very, very fine man, lives in Arkansas. And I've always questioned whether or not I was a tan. I've got an older sister. She's one year older than I, and, and uh, she probably is a tan, most likely. But I always questioned, and I'm not sure why I did. But I asked uh, Clayton, I said, would you mind doing a DNA thing with me? I'd be more than happy. To, um, to, actually, my son paid for it. And um, uh, he said, sure, and we did. And sure enough, I, we're not related in any way whatsoever. None whatsoever. Recently, by through doing some other DNA stuff, but I'm really trying to find out who my family is. And to you, it may not be important, but it's kind of important to me. I'd just like to know who my family is. I know who my daddy is, amen? <laughs> I know who he is. But I kind of like to know who my family is. So I have found out that, that I am a Clements. Uh, that's who, who I come from. don't know who my, who my daddy was. May not ever know who my daddy was. That's not as important to me as just knowing who, where I came from. And I've met... A few weeks ago, when I was in Louisiana, I met some third cousin Clements, and they're pretty cool people, pretty cool people. Went to a Methodist church, and I'd never been to a Methodist church in my entire life. Only church in town, Lisbon, in Lisbon, Louisiana, where my daughter lives, and there is no other church there, and we was visiting there for my granddaughter's graduation, and I wanted to go to service, and we always have worship there at the house as well, but I thought, well, I'll just go to this Methodist church, and went there and found out that my, my I don't know how many greats it would be, great, 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 great grandfather actually pastored that church at one time and that actually the Methodist church was started in his in, in, a, in some Clement's home with seven people does that ring a bell uh, wow. Oh, wow. we started life bridge in, in our home with seven people plus Linda and I thought, thought that was pretty cool but going back to the verse of scripture when it says you watched me as I was been formed in utter seclusion now somebody be offended by what I'm about to say but I said anyway I might have been conceived in the back of a Ford pickup truck. I don't really know. <laughs> but God said, I was watching. I may have been conceived in sin. What happened when I was conceived may have been in total, may have been a sinful, 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 sinful thing. But for whatever the reason may be, God took that and created who you know as Charlie Russell Ellison. Hallelujah. And let me tell you something. Things like that bothered me a lot for a while. But I'm getting past my hurts, habits, and hangups. Amen? Amen. Come Tuesday night and you get past yours too because we do some great stuff on Tuesday night. The psalmist says, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. I was woven together in, dark, in, in the dark of, of, the, of the wound. You saw me before I was ever born. Now look at this. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Now this is not talking about the Bible. This is talking about the books, book of life. A lot of people don't understand the book of life. One of these days we'll do a study on the book of life. It's very, very interesting. In, in Revelation, it refers to the book of life. That's talking about the book of life. That's what, that's what everything's recorded about you. And it says, even before I was born, every day of my life was already recorded. Because why? Because of God's foreknowledge. People get all hung up about the foreordination and the predestination of God. It's so simple. Because of God's foreknowledge, He foreordained that Jesus Christ would come and die for the believer, and every believer is predestined to have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Because of what He believed. 
Jesus. God has a plan for your life. A special plan that nobody, it's a unique plan. Jamie, God's got a plan for your life. God's got a plan for every individual that's in this service. Now, listen to me carefully, because this is where it gets a little bit mixy. Are you listening? You can alter God's plan. Did you hear that? Amen. God has it planned. But you have the ability. <laughs> Most preachers won't tell you this, but it's the truth. You have the ability to change God's plan to your plan. Do you believe that? You can mess up your life. Now, the, pl the plan that God has for your life is a wonderful plan. It's a plan that will bring about John 10.10, 10, that wonderful and sweet life that Jesus came to give to all of us. Amen? Isn't that wonderful? That's the sweet life. That's the life that Jesus came to give to all of us. But you can change God's plan for your life. You can get on a self-deconstruct plan and destroy that wonderful creation that God made when He made you. Whew. I think I'm beginning to realize why God wanted me to talk about this. Amen. I think I'm beginning to realize this. And gosh, it's already gone longer than five minutes. Some people need more talking to than others. You're not an accident. Pre-planned by God. His plan does not include self-destruction, but He permits it. Listen, there is, you, you've, got the, you've got the divine will of God, and you've got the permissive will of God, and they're two different things. People don't understand that. The divine will of God is what God has pre-planned. The permissive will of God, He already knows about it, but He permits it. D does that make sense to you? He will permit even bad things to happen to you, even though it wasn't what He planned, but He will permit it to happen. He will permit you to do some stupid stuff. And if he permits it, if you will, after he permits it and it happens, if you will allow it, God will fix it. Romans 8, 28 says that very clearly. Very, very, very clearly. Now, let me share a couple of things with you again. I've never heard a preacher say this other than myself. I've never, you've heard me say it, time, some of you have heard me say it time or two. But I've never heard, I don't, and, and I really don't understand why preachers don't say this, because it is the truth. It's the absolute truth. But this is it. It is not your fault that you are a sinner. That is not your fault. The Bible says, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, if you want to put blame on being a sinner, you've got to go back 6,000 years. And by the way, I'm related to that guy as well. And you are too. And the truth of the matter is, he didn't even accept the blame at the beginning he blamed God. He said, God, it's not my... F God said, Adam, look what kind of mess you got yourself in now. And Adam said, God, it's not my fault. It's your fault. You gave her to me. <laughs> no, that's, what, that's what he said. Yeah, it's, it's her fault. And you're the one who gave her to me. 
And Eve said, hey, it's not my fault. I was deceived. But it was Adam's fault. You see, Adam wasn't born in sin like you and I. I couldn't say to Adam, Adam, it's not your fault that you're a sinner. It was Adam's fault. He chose to do that. We are sinners not by choice, but by birth. The second thing I'll share with you is not only is it not your fault that you're a sinner, it's not your fault that you became lost. But listen to this. It is your fault if you stay lost. Romans 6.23 says the result of sin or the wages of sin is death, which represents hell. If you go to hell, those of you that's in this service right here, those of, those, those of you that will listen to the service or watch the service on the video, if you go to hell, it's your fault. Because you've heard the truth, and I will tell you some more in just a few, few moments. It's your fault if you stay lost because God made provision. It wasn't your fault that you became a sinner, so this is what God did. God made a provision for you to be unsaved, unlost, I should say. Unlost, is that a good word? God, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anything about English, so I don't know if that's a good word or not. What would be the Spanish word? I, you, don't, you probably are. Um, what I mean by that is, if you stay lost, it's your fault. And you have a choice in the matter. God, God won't make you get saved. He provides a means. By the way, we who are here, or who are saved, it's our fault if we don't tell them. Amen. Amen. We need to share the truth so that they can do Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God provides the means for our salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Now, let's talk about that very briefly. I realize that the world teaches that there's a hundred different ways to get to God. Maybe a thousand different ways to get to God. The world will say, you can go to heaven if you are a good person. The world says, you can go to heaven if you join the right church. You know, I'm a Baptist. I am proud to be a Baptist. And I don't mean to be critical toward any other church. But we are not going to take Baptists off our name. I like being a Baptist. I'm proud of being a Baptist. Because of what we teach, we proclaim the truth. Amen. But... I am so thankful you don't have to be a Baptist to go to heaven. Amen, I'm grateful to that. I do think you ought to be a Baptist if you're going. That's not biased. Amen. <laughs> There's no bias. <coughs> but Jesus said this, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. Amen. The world may talk to you differently, but the Bible says there's only one way. Now how does all that fit into what I said at the very beginning? You will never be able to get on God's plan for your life until you go through Jesus Christ. If you go back to Ephesians 2.10, he's mentioned specifically in that verse of Scripture. Specifically. 
So that's the first step of achieving God's plan for your life is accepting Jesus Christ. Listen, not only as Savior, but also as the Lord of your life. Amen. Savior and Lord. And it, when we lead people to Christ, on, if you use our church track, um, what we, say, we will ask people, are you ready to accept Christ as your Savior and follow him? Amen. We said something along that line. Because we want people to be ready to follow him when they accept him as well. Amen. Amen. And begin to fulfill what God's plan is for their life. Let me conclude with John 10.10. 10. Why don't you jump over there with me? Let's read that together. John 10.10. 10. <laughs> Every time I preach, I tell you, I think that's my favorite verse of Scripture. They all are. Some of them more so. John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Amen. Who is the thief? Devil. You see, the devil, he takes great pride in keeping you from getting on God's plan for your life. And he does a great job. People listen to him more than they do God. The thief does not come but to steal and to kill and to destroy, Jesus said. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Would you agree with me that you will never have the abundant life until you get on the bus with Jesus? Would you agree with that? Then what are you waiting on? I was saved at the age of 16. John, I didn't get on the bus until I was 24, and I'm very ashamed of that. I wasted uh, about eight years. Wasted. And there were some folks that died and went to hell because of my waste. And that breaks my heart tremendously. Evelyn Ellison was the lady, her and her husband, who adopted me. And um, Sydney and Ella, Sydney and Evelyn was good people. They just was not church people, but they was good people. Evelyn, uh, Evelyn uh, was a drug addict. When I was living in Jonesboro, Arkansas, I was about age 22. And I got a phone call. I was out, and I, when I came home, Linda said, we've got to go to Memphis. Your mother has uh, caught the house on fire, and, and uh, she's not doing good. So we rushed to Memphis. And by the way, Evelyn is my real mom. Sydney's my real dad takes more to be a mom and dad than to conceive a child. She's my mama. She had problems, but she was my mama. We went to Memphis and I went into the John Gaston Hospital, in the burn unit. And I told him who I was. Linda was with me. And I said, I want to see Evelyn Ellison, my mama. And the nurse said, you don't want to see her. And I said, yes, I do. It was terrible. The smell was awful. All of her hair and everything was burned off. 
the amazing thing is mama could talk and it didn't seem like she was in pain I, yes. amazing one of the first things she said to me is she said oh your daddy's going to be so upset with me I caught the house on fire I said it'd be okay mom we visited and I told her I'd see her tomorrow and that was the last day last time I ever spoke to her she died went into a coma that night died three days later but this is the sad thing Let me tell you, this is the reason I'm sharing this story with you I was saved but I never shared Jesus with my mom I don't know where she is You said she was, but pastor, you said she was a good woman. If being good would get you to heaven, why did Jesus come and die? I wasted some years. Somebody said, well, it just hurt you. No. What about all those that need Jesus that I didn't tell anybody about? Folk, I challenge you this morning to get on God's plan for your life so that you can begin to help others. It'll help you, but you'll be able to help others as well. Would you stand very quietly as we pray?